Mini PCs are fun, but we can always use more power. The folks at Ace PC sent this little beauty my way. This is the WizBox G for me to take on a test drive, play some games on it, and share my thoughts. I love tinkering with little mini PC builds. Simple, straightforward computers, they're really versatile. And shopping around a little, we can find some amazing price to performance deals. In the last review I shot on this channel, I made a quip that generations of hardware updates can sometimes be represented in $50 price increments and this box here helps validate my little joke. Where my last review was on an AMD machine with a two year old Ryzen chip, this machine boasts the new Ryzen 7, 7735HS released this year, and the pricing is pretty close. Mini PCs, there are different form factors and different features to look out for. For the WizBox G specifically, the idea is a bit more aggressive. We've got two different colors to shop, but I'm glad Ace PC sent over the yellow option as it kind of helps better show the design off this triangular mini tower shape with some hard edged lines and graphics printed on the sides. And all the RGBs you'd want on an enthusiast machine. It certainly looks the part. And I pointed this out in previous videos too, that different form factors have different applications. Where we might have a smaller Nook or Nook clone, this square case, a 4x4, can be easily mounted to the back of a computer's monitor on a VESA bracket. These slightly larger mini tower machines are just going to live on your desk. And I found very generally though that the upright build and the larger surface area gives us a nicer, lower frequency tone for fan noise. got a little more space for cooling. That's also a major aspect of this build. We've got a selectable performance dial, which is kind of the return of the turbo button. As far as I can tell, it doesn't change up the behavior of Windows, but it seems more to be a different fan curve for the case. When you want to run near silent, we expect more throttled performance and heavier compute tasks. Or we can let the fan go full bore and keep the CPU and GPU cooled a little better. But even at full speed, this is quieter than some of those Nook style cases we've reviewed in the past. Full array of ports, and I'll list them all out here somewhere on the screen. And Ace PC shows off triple monitor support, two HDMIs and the USB-C off the front at 4K resolutions. I'm also just really stoked to see more and more consumer machines coming with 2.5 gig ethernet for faster home networking. I've got a little NAS set up on a 10 gigabit internet switch and now transferring files across my home network so much speedier. Why I get so lit up for the bang for buck on mini PCs, they're now often sold as complete systems. Now, the original Nook line were bare bone systems that the user would have to source their own RAM and storage and install an operating system. I love these as a first project build for folks interested in learning about DIY computers. But I also totally appreciate the folks who just want to buy and go. My review system came with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 4800 RAM and a 512 gigabyte NVMe SSD with Windows 11 pre-installed. Someone totally might want to shop faster RAM or a bigger SSD, but it's tough to outright beat that pre-built price. And this enthusiast style is more than skin deep. Now I've geeked out on mini systems before, like, oh, it's only four screws to get to your RAM and storage. Oh, it's only two screws to get to your RAM and storage. Well, how about no screws to get to your RAM and storage? Magnets, how do they work? <laughs> yeah, it's just two magnets at the top and the panel just kind of pops right off and you can get to your RAM, your NVMe SSD, and there's a little tray for a SATA SSD so you can add even more storage to the machine. Which is an interesting little philosophical difference that even when the compute components are a bit more soldered into the shell, an enthusiast would still want the ability to tinker easily with a few of the other components in their system. Which is where we should probably chat about performance, where I've gotten really excited about bang for buck systems. <laughs> Not long ago, the major cost savings were on mini PCs with significantly older laptop specs. If the new chip out was Intel 11th gen, the inexpensive machines were sporting 8th gen. I have the 9th gen Core i9 Nook behind my TV, and even while Intel 10th gen was out, 
the Nook was a really expensive box. Only about two years from then, this market is now crazy brutal with much more recent options from AMD and Intel, and the wins really come down to the sales you can find day to day. I feel though, very generally, AMD is taking the edge right now in price to performance. Now I don't run super in-depth benchmarks, but I do like to cover a couple data points over a series of small tests. I most recently reviewed a mini PC with an AMD 5800H, which is kind of what I'm using is my comparison point in my brain. This is where chip names get a little confusing. The first number is kind of like a generation, and the second number is the tier of performance within that generation. Where AMD is positioning mobile processors, I'm not aware of any mobile Ryzen systems using a 7800H or HS designated chip. I did a little casual searching to see if there were any systems like that. Please drop a link if there's a laptop out there with a chip that I'm not aware of. For a lot of these options, it seems the 7735HS is kind of taking the place of what would be an 800 series part. The letters at the end matter too. A U series processor is a bit more power efficient. A single H at the end is a more powerful chip, and the HS is often positioned as an in-betweener part between U and H. I'm grossly oversimplifying. A lot more goes into chip design and product packaging, but this is just sort of a general lay of the land. Why I got so excited for the 7735HS though, it noticeably outperforms the 5800H in most tasks, and in a lot of tests on paper, it's often within margin of error territory against the 6800H, even though it's labeled an HS and it's technically a tier below, being a 700 chip instead of an 800 chip. I don't put a ton of stock into synthetic benchmarking apps like Geekbench, but as a place to start the conversation, we see respectable generational uplifts in CPU performance, but the major difference is on the GPU side. AMD delivered a major upgrade to the little integrated GPU when they moved from Vega 8 to the Radeon 680M. Those scores are well reflected in Geekbench, and we'll talk about some gameplay in just a bit. Now, the synthetic scores don't always reflect real world performance. One small example of this in a very specific task, file compression. My mini PC running the 5800H, this was the only win it had against the newer 7735HS. Could be drivers at the time of testing or the fan utilization and how the smaller PC is significantly louder at full speed, but it did eke out a small win over this Ace PC when we're looking at RAR file compression. But then everything gets way better for the newer chip in every other test I run. A quick 4K video editing test, simulating someone cutting up a one minute youtube -y style video with transitions and a watermark and a soundtrack in DaVinci Resolve. The WizBox G was 11% faster than my 5800H mini PC for a CPU render. And my main workstation is getting a bit long in the tooth these days. It's a Threadripper 2970. And for short bursts of CPU video rendering in the free version of DaVinci Resolve, this generation of mobile Ryzen has finally outpaced my old desktop Threadripper. When laptop parts are directly outpacing my workstation, that means I've got to put together a new workstation build. The GPU rendering, uh, showcasing the move from Vega 8 graphics to the 680M is even more intense, a 34% improvement to GPU rendering speed. It puts this little box well within the performance envelope I would want to see for those folks who want to play with some legit video editing software and are interested in heavier workloads and we would normally associate with little home computers and family video projects. It's capable of getting a higher tier of work done. All well and good, but what you really want to hear about in this video is gaming, right? Over the last two years, that's where these little systems have exploded in functionality. Every review I'm cutting right now, we're talking about noticeable improvements and the ability to play more graphics demanding games. I don't believe we need to spend much time anymore on the arcade titles, 4K resolution for Vampire Survivors or TMNT, Shredder's Revenge. We have no issues pinning 60 frames per second, even into end game scenarios with tons of enemies on screen. I still like to show off Tetris Effect as a deceptive demanding game, it's Tetris. But you really want to keep your frame rates high, and the background graphics can take up a bit of processing power. I'm sure not a lot of folks are expecting that. We still have to turn down some of the quality settings, but now we're capable of keeping consistent 60 frame per second gameplay running at 4K. With the Vega 8 graphics previously, we had to choose between 1080p resolution 
with a little more eye candy at 60 FPS, or we could play at the lowest possible quality settings in 4K at closer to 45 frames per second, which is not what you want for end game Tetris runs. Moving on, for the types of games I like to play, I usually show off the opening sequence of Hellblade. Brute Force, 4K, and we're at an unplayable 12 to 14 frames per second, but this is still a significant generational improvement. Then, FSR support has also steadily improved, and we're in better shape with AMD's upscaling technology, hovering around 30 frames per second, and it looks real good. There's no built-in support for FSR and control, but if we scale back the rendering resolution to 1080p and disable some of the motion blur effects and turn off the ray tracing, we're able to stay in the high 20s and low 30s even during combat scenarios. It's not the prettiest presentation of one of my favorite games, but it's totally playable and enjoyable. Lastly, I'm not rocking a PS5 right now, so I feel totally left out for not playing Spider-Man 2, so I fired up Spider-Man Remastered. Again, with solid support for FSR, we're nearing in on console-grade quality, mid-40 frame rates for web swinging around New York, and the Wizbox manages to stay above 30 frames per second in combat sequences which is about where we should start wrapping this video up, I'm inclined to chat gaming first, as I think that's the enthusiast, the enthusiast focus Ace PC is going for. Two years ago, near this price, I was showing off drastically limited capabilities for 720p gaming on old AAA titles. The older mini PCs near this price, maybe you were firing up a Super Nintendo emulator for a good gaming experience. Today, we're better supporting more current titles, more graphics intense titles, and we're in a price envelope competing much better against consoles. My older Core i9 Nook, the one I mentioned behind my TV with a 1660 Super GPU can still beat this little box, but the GPU by itself is drawing roughly twice the power of this whole system. And these things aren't just consoles. It's a whole PC, a flexible PC. We've got specs here that rival the M2 series Mac Mini. AMD's chip is going to draw more power, which would definitely be a concern in a showdown between laptops. But on a mini desktop, that's a little less precious. Now, that might not sound super exciting as Apple just announced the M3 at the time this video was shot, but the refurb pricing on a Mac Mini with the same amount of storage is $300 more than the MSRP of the Wizbox G. And even the outright used pricing on an M2 Mac Mini with half the storage is closing in on the brand new price of the Wizbox before any sales or deals or coupons. Plus, you can swap out the RAM and add a ton more storage to the Ace PC. You want more storage on a Mac Mini? That pie's been baked. You gotta go with external drives. I popped in this four terabyte SSD on the Ace PC, which cost me around 140 bucks. You're not getting a four terabyte upgrade from Apple for 140 bucks, not with that Apple tax. Now the Intel fight is a little more nuanced. You know, say we want to go with a 13th gen Core i7, a similarly built Intel mini PC would likely take wins in CPU compute tasks, but I think AMD would still have the edge on GPU compute and gaming. Also MSRP on an Intel machine might be around 100 or $150 higher, which is, that's the last little note for my conclusion here. MSRP is a tough metric to use for comparisons. I still hold to MSRP MSRP is the first step in categorizing, but mini PCs fluctuate wildly on price and on sales, and these companies are regularly running deals and coupons. The month of October, the Wizbox was available under a Halloween promotion for $50 off. That might not sound like a huge savings, but it's another chunk of cash you could save against a Mac Mini purchase. And what did we establish at the top of this video? That $50 could be the price difference between a whole year newer processor generation. So I I want to leave this off with a question, and this one's a little bit more in depth than what I usually ask at the ends of my videos. I review these boxes first as family or office computers. Easy, cost-effective ways to place a small lump of compute power in your home, office, bedroom, in your dorm room. So I've been itching to tackle more of a server-style challenge, and I'd like to see if I could use one of these to replace Google Photos on my phone. I've been looking at services like Image or PhotoPrism or Nextcloud. Two terabytes of cloud storage on Google Drive is $100 a year. If this was run exclusively as a little mini photo server, I'd have twice the available storage and I'd pay it off in around six years compared against a Google cloud storage solution. This PC right here 
is ludicrous overkill for only being a photo server backup solution. I digress. What would you recommend as a service for me to try, maybe shoot a video on, as a little file server or Google Photos replacement? Please drop me some suggestions down below and, and maybe smash that bell icon on your way down. I will, of course, leave more information on Ace PC Systems and the Wizbox G. A link will be in the description below. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Those of you who are clicking on links in the descriptions, hitting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. Uh, this list is basically the coolest collection of geeks in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on all of social media these days, but I'm spending most of my time on the Mastodons, sharing photos on the Flickers, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next review.